right, let's get started here in, in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now, now remember, we looked last week, there is, there's this rivalry that had been brewing, essentially, um, not so much a rivalry between John the Baptist and Jesus, but between John the Baptist's followers, they were envious, they were jealous, uh, as Jesus' ministry is continuing to flourish and to grow, and we looked at that, and so... Uh, both of those ministries are climbing, except Jesus now has become kind of that, that popular figure that everybody's flocking to, to listen to, to respond to. And in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, it says this, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Okay, so once again, Jesus' popularity has continued to increase to the point where it says the Pharisees now are talking, they're, they're hearing about Jesus' incredible popularity in comparison to even John the Baptist, who they were skeptical about uh, as well. And so Jesus, knowing that this conflict is brewing and knowing also that it is not yet time, it is not the Father's will yet for that public confrontation to take place. Jesus has more work to do. So he leaves and he heads to Galilee. Now, in order for, for Jesus to go that way, there was a couple different routes that he could take. And it says that he had to go through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. Now, it's really important that we kind of understand why that's significant, why that's important when it talks about Samaria. Uh, because if we don't really understand, we just look at that as like no big deal. He chose to go through there. But to understand Samaria, Samaria is this region, this area that is uh, north of, of Judea, and then you have Galilee up here, and it's this little region area, and this history of Samaria and the Samaritans, it's traced back to all the, all the way back to King Solomon. After King Solomon, um, after his reign, the kingdom was divided into a northern kingdom, Israel, and a southern kingdom, Judah. Those who were in the northern kingdom, they constructed their own capital called Samaria, this city. And then we, we read in, um, well, we know from history, in 722 BC, the Assyrians came and they conquered the northern kingdom. When they conquered the northern kingdom, they took people, they took Israelites out of that northern kingdom, they brought them back, but then they also, with the remaining pocket of people that still live there, the Assyrians brought in people from pagan nations and all these other cultures, brought them in, and there was intermarrying that happened, uh, and, and all these other things, to the point where all of a sudden, uh, their religion is blended. They start to incorporate all these different things. Because there's these different people coming from different cultures, different backgrounds, different belief systems. And so not only are these people not considered pure Jews, but they're also now blending uh, how they worship. In fact, they switched the worship from being Jerusalem being the headquarters to Mount Gerizim. And so, and so the, the Jews see this area, this pocket, and, and literally over the course of hundreds of years, this animosity has just grown between this area, Samaria, and the rest of the Jewish population. And so we see this pocket here called Samaria. It's, it's in the middle. Um, and literally, Jews, when they would travel north to south or south to north, they would, for the most part, bypass Samaria because they didn't even want to walk through it. They felt like they would be unclean by just walking through Samaria. And so when, when we see Jesus say, um, I'm going through Samaria, it kind of broke some social norms at the time. Because dedicated Jewish individuals, they would walk around it. They would literally go out of their way so that they didn't have to be around these Samaritans. They hated each other. And so 
As Jesus says, I'm led to, I need to go there, we know that his reason, as we're going to read in a minute, was because there was a divine appointment there. Now, as he uh, arrives, it says he goes to this town in Samaria called Sychar. Now, this is near uh, the land that Jacob had given his son Joseph in Genesis chapter 48. Okay, before he died, he gave him some land, and that's actually where then Joseph ends up being buried, um, but that's Jacob's land, and it was very significant to the people because there was a well there. They called it Jacob's Well, and it had been about 2,000 years from that moment to when Jesus is on the scene, and so for 2,000 years, this well has stood the test of time, and people are still getting water out of it. In fact, that well is still there today. If you and I jumped on a plane and went, we could go there and drink some water. Pretty awesome. And so we see Jesus is there. He's sitting at this well. It's about the sixth hour. And when we look at how they, um, how they established time in those days, the hour started at 6 a.m. So the time was 12 o'clock in the afternoon, the hottest time of the day. And Jesus, remember, being fully God, fully man, is tired, it says. He's experiencing that human nature. He's, he, he's tired. He's weary. It's hot. And he's all by himself because it says his disciples went into town to grab some food. And then in verses 7 through 9, it says this. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So this woman comes out, this woman from Samaria, she comes to draw out water. Now what's unique about this is ordinarily the, the women of a village or, or a town, they would go together in a group either in the early morning or in the evening after the sunset. Why? Because it was cooler at those times. And they would go together and they would get enough for the, for the day or for the next day, uh, enough water to clean and, and to use for cooking and whatever. And, and so what's unique about this is she's by herself. Nobody's with her. She's going at the hottest part of the day. And then also we know from studying that there were other water sources that were closer to her village and she bypassed those so that she could go to this well. Now what we see here is a picture of the social standing that this woman had. Okay, she was considered an outcast. Now we're gonna talk about next week what specifically she had done that had led to her being an outcast, but she's the one that's looked down upon. She's the one that other women gossip about. And so to avoid that public shame of her story, of her life, of her mistakes, she goes by herself at the hottest part of the day in the desert. She goes to get water, and this is her rhythm. And she walks even a greater distance just so that she can avoid all these other women. And Jesus is there, and as she approaches, he says, hey, give me a drink. Now, she's not like, okay, let me get you a drink. No, she's shocked, right? Because she knows that he is a Jew. She knows this is not the social norm. This is not how our culture operates because Jews typically wanted nothing to do with Samaritans. And she's not only surprised that Jesus is talking to her, but Jews also considered themselves unclean for, for drinking out of the same vessel or the same cup as a Samaritan or, or eating the same, off the same utensil. And so literally everything about this interaction to her is like, what is going on? Do you not get that I'm here at this time? Do you not understand the ramifications for that? Why are you talking to me? See, what we see here in this inter interaction is, you guys, the social norms of the time, it never dictated how Jesus loved people and how he did ministry. 
In fact, he was criticized throughout his ministry repeatedly for his interactions with people. In Mark chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, He's actually going to the house of a tax collector, Levi, who's Matthew. He goes to his house, and it says this. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? I love this. I love this because, you know, uh, for us, I think we try, we seek out the, the people that we think we will become, we will be most comfortable with. And those are the people we choose to have dinner with, right? I think I like them. Honey, we should invite them over. I think we could connect. I think we could get close with them. Um, man, they seem to be at the same stage in life. Or, man, I really respect them. Let's have them over to our house. And what you see Jesus do and model is actually the opposite. And we don't even, it doesn't even get caught up in, in, in what all these different people had done. It just says they were a bunch of sinners. So there's tax collectors who are the most despised people at that time in the Jewish nation. They ripped off their own people for profit, and they represented Rome. They worked for Rome. But then also, just these other, just it calls them sinners, are all sitting there. And there is Jesus having the time of his life, ministering to them. All throughout his ministry, he's criticized for this. And so what we see here uh, is him once again defining what he's about and who he's there to reach. You know, when you look at a couple weeks ago, we looked at Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus was uh, a Pharisee, a leader of the Pharisees. He was like in the Sanhedrin, the, the, literally the, the religious governing body for the Jews, and, and we think about that meeting that happened, and we go, well, that makes sense. Jesus is meeting with, like, the top guy, okay? So, so that makes all the sense, sense in the world that Jesus would want to meet with him. But then we see, just in a, in a matter of, of verses in a chapter later, Jesus is meeting with this Samaritan woman who has a story that is the opposite of Nicodemus's. And as highly regarded as Nicodemus was, she was in that way disregarded. What is the message that he's telling us? He's saying it doesn't matter. What he's saying is Nicodemus was lost and this lady's lost. I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. And so that's what, that's what he's about. No matter who the person is, no matter what they've done, no matter what language they speak, where they call home, every person needs Jesus. See, Jesus also, I, I look at this and I go, man, Jesus, this isn't the greatest strategy if you're trying to reach Samaria, right? Why wouldn't you do this big evangelistic crusade in the capital of Samaria, do this big event, right? Because, because that's what works. I think a lot of times uh, we, we, when we talk about sharing our faith or, or the gospel, we, we literally go, we need this outreach event or, or this program, then we can reach these people. But what we see is Jesus do something different. Jesus sat at a well and shared with this woman. Where's your well? Where's that well at for you? Is it at your office? The cafeteria at the, at the office or at your school? Is it, is it the fence? Right? In your backyard, I was just having a conversation with my neighbor over the fence. Right? We were like socially distanced, everything. Maybe it's that fence line at your house. Maybe that's where you go to have an interaction like this. Maybe it's just seeing someone and you decide to sit next to them, six feet, of course, apart, and you start talking to them. You notice something. You see something in them, or you just randomly end up at the same place weekly because your kids are in the same activity or something, and just maybe God's like, have a conversation. Just a conversation. See, what blows me away here is this one conversation changed 
this woman's life. And for a lot of us, we've been so conditioned and, and so trained that all of these things have to happen. The music has to play. The worship has to be just right. The sermon has to be on point, And everything has to align. And if that aligns, someone will respond. That's not the case at all. We see the gospel advancing person to person, and we see it happening through conversations. There is so much power in one conversation. So much. Don't negate that. Look for those moments. Pray for those moments where, where it's just one conversation. One conversation changes this lady's life. We see Jesus responds to her question. She's like, why are you talking to me? Verse 10 and 11, it says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? In other words, Jesus, in, in response to her saying, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. This isn't how we do business. And Jesus literally says, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for living water. Now, now she's, she's confused. <laughs> she says, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is 100 feet deep. Where then and how are you going to get this living water? See, it was... It was the custom of, of travelers to take a long goat skin bucket to retrieve water, but Jesus didn't have one. His disciples probably brought that into the village. And the woman says, you have no bucket. You don't have anything to draw water, much less this water with. Where are you going to get this living water? How are you going to bring it up? Where is it at? And, and, and so we're confronted with the question here that every single person has. Where can I find that which satisfies me. Guys, your life is a pursuit of something to satisfy your thirst. And we only find the living water by coming to Jesus. Through him, we discover the satisfaction we look for so desperately in other things. Man, we're all seeking for that which we think is going to satisfy us. We make decisions regardless of your work or your job, your occupation. You are making decisions that ultimately you think are going to bring satisfaction for your life. And, and I think the danger for us, especially in our culture, is we're convinced that we can do it all ourselves. We know what's best for us. And since we know what's best for us, we're the best ones to make it happen. And we see within all of us, there is a desire to accomplish it, right? For us to be able to do it. Even in uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 18, it talks about the ruler approaching Jesus. And it says this, and a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There is this desire in all of us to do something in order to get something, to achieve salvation, to achieve the satisfaction and, and what we understand and know as our lives continue to pursue that is, one, we can't do it ourselves. But two, we don't want to admit we can't do it ourselves. See, the promise of, of living water, it's all throughout the Bible. We'll look at some verses in a minute. But, and, but with it also, we find the result of rejecting the living water that Jesus offers. See, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, the prophet says this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So he's speaking to God's people. And God's people, at this time, they had the fountain of living water available to them, for free, at any point in time, they could have that. It was available. But they abandoned God and attempted to find satisfaction elsewhere. We can build our own. We can make this happen apart from God. We know what we need here. We don't need that. 
And instead of drinking freely from the fountain of God, they took out their hammers, they took out their chisels, and they started carving out these containers and digging their own wells. And every time they poured water into these containers, what? It was cracked, it couldn't hold the water, it didn't measure up, it didn't satisfy. See, they thought satisfaction, they sought satisfaction in something other than God. Later in Jeremiah 17, 13, he says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. See, God is the only source of salvation. Psalm 36, 9, for with you is the fountain of life, and your light do we see light. And then in Isaiah 12, 3, he says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You guys, the essence of, of sin is pursuing satisfaction in something other than God. That's the essence of sin. See, we, we think sin is like this checklist of do's and don'ts. Don't lie. Okay, I don't do that. Don't steal. Don't cheat. Um, don't gossip. All these things, right? We've created this list of do's and don'ts, but, but what we fail to see is the deeper issues of sin. I sin any time I pursue satisfaction in something other than God. What is that? That's idolatry. Placing something on the altar of my heart and giving myself to it and hoping that it will do for me what only God can do. And this is the struggle. And this is what the Bible warns us about over and over and over again. That's what Adam and Eve wanted. And we see uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, 10 and 11, it's King Solomon talking here who literally did everything and more. You think you've pursued happiness. Well, he pursued happiness, but he also had an unlimited supply of money. Okay, so, so literally when you think of, man, I struggled, I tried this out, like, like he tried it out, but he, he tried it out to the max. And he says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, 10 and 11. He says, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. He tried to, he tried to quench that thirst. Guys, I want to be clear. God is not opposed to your pursuit of happiness and satisfaction. He's not. He made you to pursue happiness and satisfaction, but he made you to pursue it in the one who can only deliver it. He designed you to find your true delight in him. And Jesus makes it clear to this woman that satisfaction is only going to be found in him. And this living water that he's talking to her about, it was salvation. See, she didn't understand, just like Nicodemus. She, when he brought up to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Nicodemus is like, what? And as Jesus is talking about this living water at the well, and she's like, you have no bucket. What are you talking about? Um, and, and so Jesus sees that she's not understanding what he's talking about. And so she continues to ask questions. And we see in verse 12 through 14, it says, she goes, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become, a, uh, become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. She didn't understand. She's like, wait, are you claiming you're more powerful, that you're greater than Jacob? Jacob, whose land this is, Jacob, the famous Jacob and his sons? Like, like no, 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 no. And you're talking to me? You can't be that significant. And Jesus' response is so great, right? Essentially, he says, hey, that is a great well. 
Man, look at it, still running 2,000 years later. That is a great well, but if you drink from this well, you're gonna have to come back tomorrow because the water that you're gonna drink out of this well won't prevent you from thirsting again. Yeah, you're gonna be fine now, but you're gonna come back tomorrow. It's not gonna solve that thirst. But then he says, anyone who drinks the water I give will never become thirsty again. And he says, it will become a fountain of water inside springing up to eternal life. Water so powerful that it not only would satisfy the thirst for a moment, okay, this is the difference here that he's shifting to, not only for the moment, but it would begin to pour up out of the soul of the person to continue to satisfy them day after day after day, year after year after year. Okay, so, so not only if you drink from this water will you find satisfaction, the satisfaction you've been desiring, the satisfaction you've been searching for in all these other ways, but it is eternal satisfaction. It doesn't go away. It's a spring of life that keeps coming out of your soul, not just coming up, but overflowing into every area of your life. And this is what he's presenting to her. He's using this water as a metaphor to describe a spiritual reality that would meet not just the need of a moment, but a need for all of eternity. Jesus offers water that will forever quench our thirst. Guys, because of our sin, each one of us, like this woman, is thirsting for something, some experience, some person, some position that we think will satisfy But everything we turn to, it leaves us empty and longing for more. We need help. Since we know we need help, we end up turning to this person, this relationship. We go all in on this activity because we think this activity will solve that. We go all in on, on, on a religion this, re- this religion will provide it. It feels good. It feels right. Like, like it's, it's meeting me in this space. So, so we go all in for this, for this religious system. And, 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 and as we continue down this road, sometimes it does feel like we found it. Right? Sometimes we go, I'm satisfied. I feel good. Man, this is awesome. But what we find over and over again is what? It fades. That fades and you're never fully satisfied. And so you need more and not only more, you need something different. See, this is what Jesus is talking about. You may find satisfaction, that you may find that and, and experience that for a little bit, but that's actually more dangerous because that leads you to think you're good. But in reality, as many of us have experienced, that fades away and what's left is something way more dangerous. We think we found help, but in the end, we're actually becoming more thirsty than we were the day before. See, C.S. Lewis called this so perfectly in his book, the Screw Tape Letters. He said, uh, he, he called this an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. And listen, every single person in this room that's experienced addiction knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. It takes more to get high, and the highs get shorter. If you've been in a codependent relationship, you know what I'm talking about. The more unhealthy the relationship became, the more you felt like you needed that other person. Those of, those of you that, that are proud, right? You're gonna need more and more applause, right? Because the moment you think you've arrived, that applause feels good, but the more you advance yourself, your position, the more you realize how unfulfilling those applause are, and now you need it even greater and greater and greater. You need more and more and more. And we see this all throughout. If you're a self-righteous person, you are gonna continue to go down this road of being a better person, of writing more moral laws for yourself, because you're gonna find that as you achieve whatever good is to you or whatever you think 
uh, means you've arrived as a righteous person. The more you do that, the more you are going to find that is unfulfilling, unsatisfying. And so you keep having to go down that road and you wonder how Pharisees came about. You wonder how, how, how Christians who sit on the sideline and just throw grenades at everybody else, you wonder how that happened. Guys, it happens immediately when we start to seek out a satisfaction in anything other than God. And the danger always is we gravitate towards ourself. But Jesus promises something different. He promises if we'll drink from the living water, not only is our thirst quenched, but we'll always have access to the living water. It becomes a spring of water within us. Once we turn to Jesus and discover in him the fulfilling, satisfying source of the spiritual nourishment, we can drink again and again. The spring is always flowing. I love how John Piper said this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Man, that's such a great quote. When we find our greatest satisfaction in him, we bring him the most glory. In verse 15, we end this time here today with, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. See, what's interesting here is the woman liked the idea of a water that would permanently take away her thirst, right? She liked that. That sounded great. But it's really interesting, the last part of her statement that strikes me. What did she want? She wanted a water, she says, that would spare her from having to come back to the well. See, whatever else the living water did, she was ready to receive it, receive it if it would just eliminate her daily trip to the well. Okay, she's like, whoa, hold on a second. You mean to tell me this will make it so that I don't have to hide in shame, that I don't have to sneak out at the worst, at the most hot time of day and go out and draw water by myself. You mean to tell me this water makes it so I don't have to keep doing that? Oh, I want that. Guys, here's the danger with that. We do this all the time with God. We will take something that God is speaking to us that has huge spiritual meaning, huge theological ramifications, and he's sharing this with you. And what we do is we start to filter it through our expectations, what we want, and we actually build out this scenario where this living water of salvation, oh my goodness, it actually means that I don't have to walk to this well anymore. In other words, I have taken literally something that God has gifted and I've said, God, I actually know a better way that this fits in my life that helps me with my problems. Now, what, what happens there? Well, what happens is we actually take and we read things and we go, how can this most benefit me? What she heard here is that this can most benefit the shame that I feel and that I experience. You guys, he wasn't saying that you're gonna wake up tomorrow and, 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 and literally like not have to experience any of the regret or the remorse or, or any of the pain that those mistakes that she's made have caused, okay? And sometimes I feel like we present this literally, hey, if you just receive Jesus, your whole life is just gonna work out great. It's gonna be incredible. Now, it is incredible, but I'm telling you right now, you gotta be careful because you will take spiritual truth that he has given us and we will, just like that lady, filter it through what we actually want and we'll say, great, so you're telling me I don't have to deal with this anymore. Be careful. See, she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand what she's asking for. She doesn't understand that Jesus is speaking to spiritual transformation. And thank God, he's not done with this lady yet. He's gonna continue this conversation with her. But here's what I wanna challenge us with. If you are thirsty, if you are empty in your life, there is an invitation that Jesus, just as he offers, offered her, he offers you. 
In Revelation 21, 6, it alludes to this. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Amen? What have you been doing in order to satisfy your thirst? Only Jesus can quench that. Whatever you crave, whatever you long for, whatever you desire, only he can fulfill that for all of eternity. And he offers that to each and every one of us. Guys, I want to, you know, I've been, I've been bringing this up now. I'm going to keep bringing it up. We're doing this. We're going we're gonna to challenge you to do this church-wide fast, this 40-day fast coming up in February. And it's going to be all about identifying these things in our lives that are creeping up on the position that only God should have in your heart and your life. And you're going to be challenged to give some of those things up over a period of time. And not only give those things up, but you're going to be challenged to pursue God in a way that maybe you've never even pursued him before. And that's going to be happening. We're going to be kicking that off on the 23rd. But I, I want you to be thinking about this because, you guys, I just, man, I, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, it's, it's getting, the water's becoming more and more muddied because we don't look any different anymore because by how we live, a lot of us, by how we speak, we're communicating the same thing, that we have a thirst that we can't find any satisfaction to. We can't, we can't figure out how to solve that. You guys, if you're a Jesus follower, he's already provided a way, but you gotta still make the daily decision to wake up and go to him. Because if you don't, you are going to choose, just like Jeremiah warned the nation of Israel, you are gonna choose to wake up each day and go, yep, that's available to me, but I'm gonna do it my way. And you guys, it doesn't work out. That's the story here. It doesn't work out, but... Jesus is available. Amen?